And thanks for joining us here on PM Express. And indeed tonight, what we're gonna do is try and help you appreciate what the numbers tell us. We spend the day poring over the numbers because we need to make sense of the outcome of the NDC's parliamentary and presidential um, primaries that went on over the weekend. We've all heard the winners. We've all know, we all know now that John Mahama won it. But there are some interesting details that we wanna isolate and help us appreciate going forward what possibly John Mama needs to do if he believes that Kamala Dufour, for example, is important for his campaign in the Ashanti region. Why is it like that? To show that he may have some role to play in the Ashanti region. Will he reach out to him? Today he says he will meet the NDC incumbents who lost. And we'll go through that as well. That is important because, of course, you have to campaign. That, that group, they have a constituency. That's why he needs them. But what about the other two presidential uh, aspirants also? So let's get straight uh, to it. What are the numbers? If you look at John Mahama, John Mahama comes up with 98.95% of the vote. Very significant, overwhelming. In all the primaries he's, he's contested in the past, he's never has he attained this particular number. So this is significant for him, and that is what he was aiming to achieve. 98.95%. That is significant. And then you come to Kojo Bonsu, who only managed 1.05% uh, of the votes. Now, what I want you to focus on, the interesting number here is the rejected ballots. And the rejected ballots tell us a very interesting story indeed. And, and why for us is the rejected ballots interesting? Because the Electoral Commission counted every vote for Dr. Kamala Dufour as a rejected ballot, right? And so immediately when you start looking at the huge numbers that you have there on your screen, which is this huge number that you see here of 4,000 662, a significant huge percentage of this will be votes that went to Dr. Kabla Dufour that the Electoral Commission counted as rejected ballots. In other words, if you look at it closely, the rejected ballots came second to John Mahama. And in the bigger scheme of things, you could say that indeed Dr. Kabla Dufour would have been in this position and not Dr. Uh, Kojo Bonsu. So that is the first thing to note in the numbers that we are beginning to look at as we break this down a bit more. And then you look at this, that tells us a breakdown of the presidential results according to the regions. If you look at the first, Greater Accra gave the most you know, votes to the winner of some 59,000 votes. Ashanti region comes uh, next. And those two regions have the overwhelming number of delegates going into this, twice as many as even the, the third place, which is the Eastern region. No, no surprise there. And look at, you know, Jomama's, you know, won this handsomely everywhere, right? Kujo Bongsu is, you know, these small, small numbers here. But as I always say, the Kujo Bongsu's numbers and, you know, President, you know, former President John Ramani Mahama's numbers aren't interesting. But once you begin to factor in the rejected ballots, then it begins to become a bit more interesting. Now, look at the rejected ballots. Which region has the most rejected ballots? That is Ashanti region, which is this particular uh, graph that you see there, the first one. Now, remember that on this same channel, when we were speaking to Dr. Kamala Dukos people, they told us that they believe their stronghold is in the Ashanti region. For which reason? Dr. Kwabna Dufour spent a significant time in Ashanti region campaigning because they believe that's where they will get most votes. And if you look really at the Ashanti region, it actually bears him out. Considering that the Electoral Commission counted votes for Dr. Kwabna Dufour as rejected, look at Ashanti region's votes. 999 rejected votes in Ashanti region alone. Our argument is a significant number of this, well in excess of possible 800 to 900 of this will be votes that went to Dr. Kwabla Dufour. And this is the number we are talking about, 999 of the votes that you see there are rejected ballots in the Ashanti region, Dr. Kwabla Dufour's stronghold, and we are seeing that story. Again, they also claim to us that they believe apart from the Ashanti region, Greater Accra region will be their next stronghold. Again, if you look at the numbers in Greater Accra, and this is the Greater Accra numbers here, we are talking about some 478 uh, rejected ballots there. Our argument is that those will also go to Dr. Kamala Dufour because the EC counted that as rejected. 
So you're beginning to see a parting imagine of a Dr. Kabnando Lufo who wasn't in the race, people still voting uh, for him in this particular uh, context. But the EC, of course, rightly counting that as rejected. And then this is even where you begin to see the picture uh, even you know, emerge even stronger when it comes to Dr. Kwamna Lufo's um, ability in this race. And what he did that, as you know, many NDC folks are pretty unhappy with him. Because if you look at the uh, total number of delegates that went into this particular race, 355,000 delegates. Total votes cast is 307,371. Total delegates who did not vote is 47,000. 721. Now, why is this interesting? Now, this is interesting because if you look at the number of those who didn't vote, remember what happened? As of the morning of Friday, a lot of delegates were not sure that this vote will come off in the first place, right? And then it came off. The argument is that a huge percentage of this number here that didn't vote may have been affected by that. That's one argument um, to back this. Then uh, secondly, and a possibility is that some of them were disappointed with the way the thing had gone, possibly didn't like Dr. Kwamna Dufour's, uh, you know, withdrawal from the race, and so they were intending to vote for him. If he's not in a race, why do we bother to go and vote at all? But 47,722 is a significant number. Now, if you look at the percentages, so we are talking about 13.44% of the voters did not vote at all. So we are talking about a turnout of 86.56%, that is huge. But considering that these are delegates who had already committed to vote, John Mahama had paid them their transportation, all of them to vote. They possibly took their money and they didn't go and vote. Why is the question you need to ask, 13.44%. This all comes down, we believe, to the Dr. Kamala Dufour factor, either because of the suit that he filed let people on setting, and so this huge number uh, didn't turn out to vote, or many of them would have voted for him. He had redrawn. There was no motivation anymore to step out there and vote. Again, another important point to consider in this race. Still on this factor, we'll come to the point we're trying to make with this as we drill down the numbers, right? Still, delegates who did not vote, and this tells you the numbers. And again, look at the Ashanti region, by the way, this you see here is Ashanti region. Out of the number that I showed you earlier, I want to go back to it. The 47,721 who didn't vote, as many as 23,347 of them were in Ashanti region alone. You see why that backs the point I was making earlier. That theory that people saw a man had pulled out we won't vote at all, right? That is a very important point I need you to you know, focus on as we begin to analyze the Dr. Kwamna Dufour, um, the Dr. Kwamna Dufour effect in this. And then you come to the Eastern region. And each time you look at the Eastern region, you begin to see the rejected ballots. Italy, right, also was the second. The second region with the most rejected ballots. Again, if you look at that, 9,241. Uh, but if you put the two together, plus the Greater Accra region of 4,350 uh, uh, people who did not turn out to vote, that begin to tell you that you cannot discount that at least in the Ashanti region, these 23,347 delegates who didn't turn out to vote will be important going forward. These are people that Jomahama will need to reach out to to get them on board going into the elections. Elections is about numbers. If indeed the party drills down the numbers like we've done, they will possibly come to the conclusion that we need Dr. Kwabna Dumpur to help us out in the Ashanti region. And as we've always said, the NDC never wins an election if they don't get above more than 20% in the Ashanti region. So that is an important factor to consider. Um, and we need to find out, I mean, and, and by the way, let's, let's, put it, let's make this um, simple. JM has shown that people who had contested him in the past, he brought them into the fold. Joshua Alabi was a second. The last time the primary came around in 2019, he came second to him. Today, he's his campaign manager. Our argument is that if Joshua Alabi had been on the ballot, he possibly would have been second. What would JM do with him going into the 2024 elections? Our argument is that you need him 
in the Ashanti region, as you're beginning to see a lot more people in the Ashanti region simply didn't vote at all, counting as possibly their man dropping out of the race. So that is one of the key things that we observed in the race. That is the Donald Trump do four factor. And then the many people, of course, who joined the race that we know now, who, you know, new faces, some of them dropping out. But this is the list that many people have been talking about today. The incumbents who lost in the primary. The Sanerugu MP, for example, ABF Husseini, has been trending all the time, right? It's been trending in the, in, in the, in, 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 on Twitter because of his fame with, you know, Proverbs. But that's him. He, he's dropped out of the race. Uh, and then you have, for me, my, I think the biggest of them is Dr. Kablando, for who you have uh, on your screen there. Um, Dr. Kablando, uh, dropping uh, from the, in terms of the primary outcome, he's lost their Pru East. A significant uh, factor there, many have said, because he was seen as a rebel. Is that why he was kicked out? He openly said, I, I can't toe the party line when it came to voting against uh, some of the uh, ministers who were recently appointed. And in his own constituency, people there filed protest against him. Many of them delegates. So he lost, right? So that's an interesting story imagined there. So there are 16 of them uh, who indeed we know now and going back to Parliament after the 2024 elections because they lost in the primary. They have one and they have more years to go and then that will be it. A lot of them indeed, some of them, you know, the Bungo MP, for example, another one who lost. But look at the margins, tiny little margins, tiny little margins there. And one of them in particular that I, I found interesting was in, in Garu, where Albert Akuka Alanzuga lost by four votes. If I were him, many say I would have asked for a recount, as we saw in the case of, uh, you know, Agbana, who is, say, who is basically saying, I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'm going to take a quick break. When I return, my guests will join me. Um, and then we, there's another factor right now we need to look at. That also came out of the NDC uh, primaries. You know, the seven NPs who sponsored the anti-gay bill, six of them are members of the NDC. And before the primaries. One of them was on the show, Roxanne Daffy Amekpo, and I said that the gay lobby were targeting them. They were sponsoring the opponents in the bid to unseat them because, of course, they have been advocating this cause. What really happened to all of them in this primary? When you look at the fact that all of them, with the exception of De La Soa, who lost, it tells a story that going next into next year, it's going to become an issue in the political campaign and whichever political party fails to appreciate how Ghanaians, and the NDC delegates have shown that, that they don't tolerate anybody who will stand in the way of passing that bill. And that will give a signal to what the ND MPP might do also going in. This is a very important thing to, to also look at. There are a lot of big issues that this NDC primary is helping us appreciate some of the issues that will become topical going into the 2024 elections. And we'll be isolating that and looking at what the numbers tell us. Stay with us. So, as you've been uh, joining us, as we've been doing the analysis uh, from the primaries over the weekend, Sam George, his face is on the, on the touch screen, but he's seated here with me. And that's why I want to go to that next. And for us, that is an important thing to look for going into next year. Going into this you know, primary, many were uncertain. What will happen to these seven sponsors of the anti-gay bill? Will they lose their seats? Because we knew, at least, Roxing had confirmed it on this show, that they become targets. So what happened to them in the primaries? It's interesting to look at. But also, it signals what will happen next year. And I've heard some joy today on the Super Morning Show saying that many of the religious bodies, both Christian and Muslim, were out there in the numbers helping and supporting his campaign because they believed in what he was representing in, in pushing through this bill and advocating for it. And that, for me, made a very important point, that going into the 2024 elections, you cannot sit on the fence on the matter because these religious forces, they have the numbers. 
And wh whoever shows his face and, and being very categorical will get their, their money going into the elections. And they have said that, that parties must declare their stance on the LGBTQ matter. And that will influence who they tell their members in the church and the mocks to vote for. And Sam Jod proves the factor here. Because if you look at his performance in the race, many thought he was going to have a significant uh, battle on his hands. As it turned out, it wasn't as, 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 as intense at all because he won this handsomely in, in, in Ningo Pram Pram. And if you look at you know, this, this bit here, we are talking about the margin that he won by in the last primary in 2019, only won by seven votes. But look at the margin this time around, uh, 410. So that's significant. At the time when we thought he was going to, he was going to struggle. So he won this handsome league there, and he was one of those obviously pushing this agenda and the religious community and like-minded people were there to make sure that he won, uh, to send that message. Another man who was also a sponsor, Emmanuel Bedra, who was also won there. And again, if you look at from the last elections to now, he had increased his margin uh, from 290 to 341 votes. And then Roxing uh, Nelson Afiamekpo, of course, won. But of course, you have uh, Samokudu Tablaka, who is also there, but he was on the post. Uh, and so for him, you know, the story really not as, as interesting. So for me, that tells a story. But De La Soa lost. What are we reading into that? I'll ask Sam George his thoughts on this. You know, I, but he, she's just um, an exception, really, uh, to the rule. All of them won. And that, for me, makes, makes an important point uh, to this. But there are also some interesting faces, a lot of new faces coming in, and, and you have Sadiq Abubakar, very interesting. Oh, but look at Charles Asiru. Charles Asiru is the son of Asiru Nketiah, by the way. Uh, and, and Asiru Nketiah will be very proud of his son getting into politics in Tano South. And of course, the former General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association also winning in the, uh, in, no, not Tano South, this is in Lambushi, in, in the Upper West region. And then Joanna Jan Kujo. Uh, that is the wife of uh, Keche, and before the elections, she really ran a very tight campaign there, and she also came through handsomely uh, in there. And then this is the one that is in the tie, which is still now being, um, which is also still now being a subject of some controversy. The party is trying to resolve this, uh, in this matter. There's one vote counted, well, Adam Agbana won, recounted. And then there was a tie, which the party will have to find a way of resolving this. That's the outstanding bit. Let me go to Sam George, who is seating. Um, he's seated already. And also Felix Swachifu. So both of them won. And so we need to say congratulations for them. Also joining us on Zoom right now is Titus Bayou, uh, who always joins us in the evening. And I would have introduced him as the General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. And we'll go straight into talking something about COVID or, you know, the workers' uh, the conditions of service for doctors. But now let me introduce him as the, uh, the, the elect, the parliamentary candidate elect for Lambusi. Thank you very much for joining us, Titus, and congratulations to you. Thank you, Evans. Um, good evening to uh, senior comrades in the studios. Indeed, you have to pay homage where homage is due. Yes, senior comrades, indeed. And guess who? The senior most of all comrades is also joining us right now. Um, he's in the passing of the MP for Asawasi, the former minority chief whip, Muntaka Mubarak. I am grateful, Mr. Mubarak, that you join us here on PM Express. I know your battle, just like Sam George, many thought was going to be fierce. It turned out that you, you really gave him a whipping. And I watched this all the way. I've interviewed you many, many times. I was in no doubt that you were, you were going to win this. And thankfully, you went through and sailed through uh, nicely. Thanks for joining us also. Um, but let me go to Sam George first because of where I was ending with this analysis of the uh, LGBTQ matter. Sam George, I'm grateful that you could join us uh, in the studio uh, right now. But I want to ask you that, that question. I mean, many going into this had thought that that was going to be an issue. On the show, your colleague, Roxanne Noss, Daphne Amekpo, had told us that, well, some, you know, gay lobbies were campaigning in your constituency trying to unseat you. Did you see that play a factor, a role at all in, in elections um, before Saturday? And if so, how did you overcome it? Well, good evening to our viewers and, um, and to my co-panelists, Felix and uh, comrades online, uh, Senior Muntaka and uh, Comrade Bayo. Well, like Roxin stated, the 
the, the interest, the various interest groups who were present on the ground. Um, they, they tried to have their say, but the forces of light had their way. Um, they did what they, they, they thought they could do best. But the, the beauty of it is that the NDC delegates have come to a position where they know what they want. They know the quality that is, is, is required in parliament. And they were not going to be swayed around by things that first and foremost they weren't convinced about, they had no conviction on. And so for me, I thought that it was a lot more of hype and noise by what I call the forces of darkness. And, and, and eventually, um, reason and logic prevailed. Okay. So forces of light and darkness is what you said, Sam George? Yes. Okay. And the forces of light won. Certainly, light always and, and to be, I'm interested in the point that you made that uh, you know the religious bodies came to support you. How how important were they in the outcome? I think it was critical that they they put their money where their mouth is, basically, as the saying goes. Um, I, I I don't think that there's any religion that supports homosexuality in any form or shape, and they have been a critical part of. They've been a critical part of the whole journey that we've embarked on, traditional authority as well. I mean, it wasn't just the religious bodies that reached out in Ningo Pram Pram. There are traditional rulers in, and authorities in Ningo Pram Pram who also intervened. And don't forget, before I started work on this bill, I engaged the two traditional councils in Ningo and Pram Pram on whether to take up this fight. I had held 18 town hall meetings. And so you had traditional authorities, you had the Christians, you had the religious bodies, I mean, under the auspices of the Office of the Chief Imam, the coalition of Muslim groups, Komog, had this national president and the national president of the Ghana Union of Muslim Students flying from Tamale to meet with all Muslim delegates. So this turned out to be an advantage instead of something that would have hurt you in the race? Well... The, the fact that you were very out there campaigning for the passage of the bill. Was well, 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 because the people of Ningo Pram Pram had said to me that in the 18 town hall meetings I had that this was something they wanted me to push. And so basically I was only f following what was their desire. And so why would they vote against mm. an MP who is doing what they've asked them to do? Would you vote against your MP if he was doing what you asked them to do? Of course not. The, out of the six of you, only the last one, you know, fell. Um, I don't know if you've called there. Do you think there's... Could we read any other meaning to that? It just, you know, I, I haven't, unfortunately. I haven't spoken with uh, Della, but the, the situation in Pando is, is not, I, I, you cannot attribute it to the LGBTQ. I mean, if you just did, uh, and you can have your team do an analysis mm. of, of her stand, or her standing in the constituency over the last two, three elections. And I mean, Sebastian Day is not a new face. He contested her the last time and came second. Yeah. And then you look at the general elections and the outcome of the general elections and how that had played out. There were even suggestions that she may not have even run uh, until she made up her mind to run. So I, I would not place um, her loss at the doorstep of, 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 of the LGBTQ influence. No. Anyway, uh, congratulations to you again. You. Uh, the, the, another, another man joining me in the studio is uh, Felix. Felix won the last time he's won again. I was just telling you before he came on the show that uh, his, his constituency wasn't interesting because it, we thought it was a foregone conclusion, and so it proved. He says, well, I was not taking it for granted at all. You also you gave it your all. Um, the results belie the intensity and fierceness of the contest. It was, it was quite eventful. Um, as you indicated, I, I did not take chances at all. I put everything into it in order to make sure that I secured victory, which in my view is necessary uh, for, as it were, rescuing the seat from the non-performing MPP MP, Elvis Uh So you may look at the results and think that oh, it was all rosy, it was all cushy. It wasn't? I, no, it wasn't. There were, there were powerful forces at play and I had to dig deep. Okay. In order to achieve this result, my campaign team worked extremely hard, and I'm most most grateful to them for, for the work they put in to, to, to enable us to achieve this, this objective. Yeah. Mm. Before I come to Munta Kamubarak, let me go to a, a new face, a new kid on the block, uh, Dr. Titus Berio. Uh, Doc, uh, again, congratulations to you. You, you won in, in Lambusi. What worked for you? I mean, I know we focus a lot on you in the media because we were all surprised when you jumped in 
and declare that you were running. We thought, well, has he nurtured the constituency? In the end, you won this, and you won this quite handsomely. What worked? Um, well, I would say it's a combination of several factors. First of all, the grace of God. Um, we thank God for that. And then lots of hard work uh, in the run-up to the election. I, among the three candidates, I think I spent the most time in the constituency. Um, like uh, um, Felix said, I gave it my all. I, I gave it more than 100% if there's anything like that. And above all, I think um, I took this decision based on calls that I have received from the constituents. And uh, it was my hope and prayer that they will keep their side of the deal, which is that when I came in, they would give me the nod. And they did just that. And then, as you would notice, um, beating an incumbent, very experienced in this field, is not that easy. And, and I congratulate and salute uh, my colleagues who uh, were in the contest. It was not that easy at all. Uh, when you look at the figures, they don't tell the full story. But it's years of work, and then um, that culminated in this. Okay, and it's showing. Uh, guess another new face also joining us. Last week he was on the show, and he had been campaigning all day. He had left here at 10, and he was going straight back into the campaigning. And he also came into this as a new face. Many said he was green, but wonders. Sadiq Abubakar joins us. Hello, Sadiq. Hello, Ivas. Great to have you, Sadiq, and congratulations to you. You brought your star you dust, you sprinkled, sprinkled it in your area, and you won. Is that what yes. accounted for this? Outcome? Come again. What, what did you say? I mean, your star dust. Remember last time you were here? We we're talking about the fact that you are coming from. Uh, in an entertainment background, and that that right, would be right. an advantage yes. for you going into the elections. Yes, you did yes. not disagree. Did that play the trick? Uh, well, I mean, not entirely. I think that just like everybody had said, I also gave it my all. Um, I had to, I, I had to spend a lot more time in the constituency, um, also because of the, the perception by a lot of people that. Um, oh, I mean, everybody felt that there are a number of people from my opponents that felt like, oh, I mean, this guy is a soft guy. I mean, he won't be able to do a lot of the the, the grassroots work. Um, but, I mean, I think that uh, I was out to prove to them that uh, I was made for this. And I've always worked hard and I always went the extra mile um, um, in everything that I've done. And we've, I've always sought to have a very, very strong work ethic. And so I just had to apply that. And so I spent time. One of the things I did, for instance, on the quiet, without anybody knowing, was that I had said to my team in the beginning that I wanted to know the faces and the houses of about a thousand delegates before the end of the year last year. You know, my I remember the first thing that popped up from within my team was like, hey, child, this is not possible. How? I mean, time no day. And I said, listen, let's do the harder stuff. Let's do the hardest work. So we spent time going. We couldn't achieve a thousand targets, but we did almost 800. Where we knew we went to each and everyone's house spoke to them, engaged them out of this 800, had their contacts, and then introduced the message to them. So by the time we were going into the branches, these group had almost, were, 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 had, were part, the, the interactions with them and the feedback, um, the, the, all of that went into the messaging that we took around during the branches, and all of that helped. So I really, really applied it. You know, at a point I had to step down from company, a company I founded, all because I wanted to apply myself fully to the process and to ensure that we leave no stand on ten as much as possible to enable us win. And that's all. That's what we did. I mean, Munta Kabobarag, you are the most experienced hand here on the show. You, your constituency was a hotbed of political um, controversy going into this, and many thought this possibly could be your last. Today, in fact, your good friend, former leader Harun Adrusu, told us at midday that you were a target um, of people in your party forces who wanted you out of that particular constituency and they were using this primary as a means of getting you out. You survived. How? <laughs> by the grace. Uh, by the grace of God. I mean, I've lost my voice. I mean, understandably, you should understand I've lost my voice. I mean, obviously, you know, I've been, God has been so merciful to me. 
I've never played. I mean, you are a witness to how hard I've worked in Parliament and how hard I've worked in my constituency. Anybody who knew my constituency when I first became a member of Parliament, I mean, we were the laughing stock of Kumasi. I mean, we were last in almost everything. I was the first to fight to break my constituency from KMA to create a new municipal. And I remember very well they were called the Zongo municipal. But by the time we did four years, from 2013 to 16, the massive development and the change. I mean, most of our schools who were, were in wood instructors have turned into blog. And so, fortunately, God had been messed with me. So I had a track record of consistency. Even though I've kept long, and as you know, 20 years is not 20 days. And sometimes there's a voter fatigue. But if you look at the election 2020 and how I was able to increase the votes of NDC in the Congress so massively, I mean, you would have thought that a premise. I mean, nobody would even try to challenge me in the primary. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, like my, you said, my leader uh, rightly said, whatever reason, all of a sudden, people within the party, some few people, uh, chose to do the things they, they, they wanted to do. For me, it was shameful because, you see, we, we don't do the things that people wanted to do to a senior member of parliament. But when you do that, you drill effort. You, you tell others who are behind that it is not worth dying for the party. I don't believe so. I believe that it's worth dying for NDC. I have stood in. I have worked tirelessly. We've done a lot of things to, to uplift the image of the party, both in my constituency, in my region, and in parliament. And I, I sincerely believe that I didn't deserve the kind of uh, unnecessary uh, fingering and uh, lies that were being uh, purported and assistance, and people tried to drill my effort and all that. But I know that they, I prevail by the grace of God. So I thank uh, Allah for all he has done for me, and I thank my team, and my thank, I thank the delegates and my constituents for the continued trust in me. It hasn't been easy, I mean, like all of them said. Obviously, when these things happened, especially starting from the removal from the leadership, I decided to refocus, because I knew the moment I was removed from leader, I knew what people were trying to uh, get at me. So I focus on my constituency, and uh, it has paid off because I, I, I worked very hard with the team. And fortunately, because I knew the constituency inside out, I wasn't a new person. I've been tested and tried many times. People can attest to the fact that my way, even my constituency, is like a knife. I won't give you my way and take it back. So those things help me, and I, I, I'm grateful. And I, I think into the future, I need to even work harder. I mean, Sam George, let, I want to drill down a bit to the, the scale of winning a primary when the delegates list has expanded quite exponentially. Um, how do you get, go around? And, and Sadiq says something. He, he gave himself a task of meeting and going to homes of a thousand delegates and seeing them on the ATF in their homes. What was your strategy? Well, for me, every election is different. No, no two elections are, are the same. Um, my first election in 2015 against the Rebelli team Mentor had a, a delegates list of 16,000. Mm. Okay, so that was completely different from 2019 where there was a delegate list of 847 and 807 voted. And then in this election, 1,747 and about 1,690 voted. So every election is different, but what is cardinal and principal is understanding what the mindset of the delegates are and being able to drill down into it, whether it's a parliamentary election or it's the presidential primaries, because ultimately you need to sell a message and you, that, that you need to know what the delegates themselves are looking out for. And, and I believe that delegates elections are just a microcosm of the general elections. Mm. And for example, going into the 2024 general elections, the key things that Ghanaians are going to be looking for. It's those same, those Ghanaians, the delegates in Ingo Pram Pram are a microcosm, they're a sample group of those Ghanaians. So for example, today when President Mahama in his acceptance speech spoke about the fact that he's going to be giving the media the free reign to work without fear. It's something that would resonate with the media fraternity, giving the fear you're working under today. When he spoke about the fact that persons who had their bonds locked up within a year of his coming into government will have their bonds or their, 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 their funds paid back to them 
will resonate with a group of people who have suffered under this government. When President Mahama spoke about reducing his ministers and appointing only 60, it's something that many people in civil society have been worried about or talking about having an advisory council that is going to have civil society play a leading role in there. It's something that matters to people. So you must be able to structure and fashion out a campaign message that resonates with the people of our country. People of Ghana today are very vexed at the corruption in the system. So when President Mahama says that he's going to investigate the Al Jazeera issue, for example, it's something that will resonate with the Ghanaian people because the Ghanaian people want to see what's happening. Civil society and the media, I've heard you talk several times about a review of our constitution. President Mahama has made a commitment in his acceptance speech today to do that. So when you, when you go into a campaign, it's not just the razzmatazz of the campaign. The electorates have become extremely savvy. And so you must speak to the hearts and minds of the people. The two different things. Speaking to the heart of a person is different from speaking to their minds. You must speak to their minds by, with, with, the, with the things that you speak about, the things that you say. Because, for example, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if I met you as a journalist, and I said to you that one of the key things that we're going to do was to make sure, or as a young man, was to create jobs, like President Mahama did again today in his speech about, about job creation for young people. That's speaking to your mind. Because as a young man, what you think about is how do you feed? How, how, how do you survive? Speaking to your heart will be about the charisma, will be about the way I approach you, the appeal, the, the, the persona of the person, the branding. So it's two different things. But winning an election comes with the science and the art of it. And for me, I think that if you looked at Ningo Pram Pram, for example, in, in that contest, this last contest, it was all about Sam George is using the common fund to buy a Land Cruiser. Sam George yeah. is, has used the common fund to buy a Land Cruiser. He's using the common fund to take care of his wife and children. Sam George walks like a policeman. Those were the campaign messages of the other side. Now, you have people who are educated and people who work in the local government service. They know that the common fund doesn't come to an MP, it goes to the assembly. But you so, think the delegates appreciate that nuance? I, well, I don't know where you come from, but in Ningo Pram Pram, they people do. do. They knew, they, 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 they knew that such a character was not the type they would send to parliament. If he could insult their intelligence by coming to tell them that the MP has used the common fund to buy a land cruiser, when they hear every four years, the brouhaha about the loan for land cruisers for MPs. I mean, people think, and that's why I said to you, the electorates have become savvy. And so when you tell them that some judge works like a policeman, they want an MP who is going to be security conscious and able to police the ballot box and protect the votes that need, the 100,000 votes Ningo Pram Pram will give to John Mahama. They want an MP who has what it takes to protect it. So if you come there as a timid soul, and come and tell them that Sam George works as a policeman. They want a policeman for the ballot box. Mm. So those are the things that would, would appeal to the hearts and souls of the people. And like, like I said, the parliamentary is just a, 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 like a subset of the larger. When you look at the presidential, whilst other people were frolicking on their own and attacking President Muhammad's personality and his enviable track record that they would have run on in the unlikely event that they became but who, but who in any flag bearer. Who would dare do that? Flag bearer. Oh. People did that in this campaign? Why? Right, where were you when Dr. Dufo was engaged in all the things? That I, he, I mean, that, at that level, you know? of course, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah, you know, but, but you, you see, whilst they were doing that, President Mahama didn't, didn't waste his time about that. I mean, he stuck to the policy issues and again reiterated them today. In, 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 in his speech, where he spoke about, for example, the scrapping of... Yeah, eggs I mean, I, I get that. So, I, I, so it's about the campaign. Level, you have to attack your... You have to try and find a way of belittling your opponents in the way that will, ex, you know, raise you up. In a mind well, of well, 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 if you... If it's you, a contest, you know. Well, the delegates are looking for substance. They pick substance over form. So when you are attacking the personality of your opponent and not delivering substance on what they will vote for you for, when you become president... They want to know if you are going to abolish ex gratia like President Mahama has made a categorical statement on. The other party is attacking the man's, the man's personality. Why? When you attack the man's personality, that was going to give us a stable economy. President Mahama has promised a stable economy and shown you how he will do it and reiterated it in his, in his acceptance speech today. That is what people look for in a leader. I mean, Felix, in your constituency, you mentioned earlier that you also had forces, sure. I mean, working against you. Sure. 
What were the tactics that were deployed against you and how did you deal with it? Well, essentially, it was about pitching myself directly against my opponent and give, crafting a message that suited the, the environment within which I was operating. Uh, essentially, delegates were compelled to make a choice between an experienced hand and a relatively new face. Who was the experienced hand here? Myself, of course. of course. I have been in this thing for quite some time. And she is a relative uh, newcomer to this. Again, having come that close in the 2020 elections, it was important to sell a message that said that I represented their best hope in terms of winning that seat. Also, mine is a constituency that is relatively rural. That does not appear to have a voice in the national conversation. So it was important to impress upon them that I was going to offer that voice, which then would catalyze, if you like, the sort of development that that constituency requires. So it was all about messaging and how that messaging uh, permeated through the ranks of the delegates. And I think that myself and my campaign team did that quite successfully. Of course, I also suffered attacks, which is not unusual in this terrain. So it was the least of my worries. There were also forces at various levels within the party that sought to undermine my efforts. But I was unfazed. I thought that it was important to focus on the task ahead and sell a message which, which resonated. You know, any time I've heard yeah. this, I've heard this a lot in the last 24 hours. Candidates saying there were forces in the party that came after them. As we've heard um, Muntaka say, um, in, uh, Harun Edris, who have said, in fact, you've also said the same, you're also repeating it. What, what is it about that? Why would anybody want you out, considering your track record and the sacrifices you've made? But that that always a, surprises me. That is a million-dollar question. You wonder what it is that people are looking for. And my, my brother here some, uh, <laughs> made a point that you have substance, and yet some choose form. Some decide that because of your hard work and uh, the sort of, if you like, popularity it brings you, you must be turned down. And so they go to extraordinary lengths. In your own party? Absolutely. I was amazed at the level of opposition I faced internally. I was amazed. But I, I was unfazed. With but who, who were these forces? Well, it's not, it's not appropriate at this, at this time to mention them. But you know them? Oh, of course. I'm did you confront them? Well, some I did. Some to I glossed over. I didn't think that whatever they did was going to be enough to convince delegates otherwise. Because they live the experience. They, they are the ones who have to make the choice. And it is their decision to make. No external force was going to influence them. And I did quite a good job impressing that upon them. At the end of the day, whatever machinations were, were put up against me failed. And I managed to sail through. But at this moment, I think that the focus ought to be on reconciliation. And so all those matters can be put behind us. As Have you forgiven them. those forces? I didn't bear them any grudge. As I told you, I was unfazed. I was a bit surprised, but I was unfazed. Were, were these senior figures, executive Some senior, some in middle level positions, some right down... That right down there on the local terrain. But like I said, I was on feast. Right? I thought that it was a challenge, and I needed to show that I could surmount such a challenge. I did so successfully with the help of several friendly forces, I must indicate. There were also many, many, many who supported my cause at all levels of the party, and I'm most grateful to them. But I guess that what it does is to offer very useful lessons on how to carry yourself within the political organization if you are going to be successful as a, as a politician. But all those lessons help in, in forging the sort of character that is required you know, to you know, blaze through uh, this, this terrain. But it was all well and good. At the end of the day, success crowned our efforts. That is what is most important. I'm curious to know from the two new faces we have, whether, because many say sometimes you are a victim of your own success. Both of you here, including um, uh, Muntaka, have succeeded in many ways in the party and beyond. And so in doing that, you may have stepped on a few toes in your own party. Maybe that's why... The but that is true. Before you go to it, that is true. That, Indeed, that's why they came for you, you. Yeah, you recall that in times past, we have had to take positions, especially yeah. in internal contests. So in doing so, there are some who get offended. They may not yeah. tell you, but they bear you a god and they hold it against you and they do everything they can to tear you down. Some I thought were my friends actually turned out to be people who were working and jostling behind the scenes to undo my efforts. But it was all well and good. For me, what matters most is often qualitative representation to the people of Abra Sebuka Mankes. And the NDC delegates have given me an opportunity to do so. I intend to take that opportunity seriously and work very hard to annex that seat for the NDC so that together with my colleagues in parliament and the party as a whole in government, uh, in parliament, I will pardon, and, my, my, and the party as a whole in government, we are able to deliver the goods to the people. But I, I have committed myself to turning around the fortunes of that consensus because they deserve it. They have enormous potential. Unfortunately, it has not been tapped because there has been a deficit in the quality of representation. I intend to bridge that gap mm. with the help of various stakeholders in that consensus. I mean, Titus Bayou, 
What's your experience there? Did you also have forces in the party coming at you, considering that you are a relatively new face coming onto the scene to contest a, a position and as important as a parliamentary candidate? Um, it's interesting, um, Evans. The dynamics are quite different in my situation. I came in, I came in with a pedigree uh, of uh, an academic, um, successful career in union leadership um, and, and a whole lot of other issues. And that in itself, um, instead of being an advantage, sometimes it's taken by your opponents as a disadvantage. And so you find a situation where uh, instead of campaigning on issues, people tend to attack you. Uh, in my instance, uh, what helped is that, like uh, my co uh, colleagues have said, is having a message that resonates with the people. I had a solid team, uh, and my campaign was championed by the youth uh, because I'm youthful myself, and I could resonate with the problems of the youth. And so the youth took up my, my, my battles for me. I did not really have uh, forces within the party working against me that I can count off. But then people will just pick things that are really good of you and turn them into negative. I faced peculiar situations in my area because there, are so, there were tribal issues um, where uh, people wanted to play the tribal card and therefore they assassinate your character. And if, I, in fact, if there's a lesson I have learned, I just told my colleagues, my next medical lecture, I'll be telling my medical student, instead of doing a DNA test, um, if you really want to know your parents, you want to know <laughs> your <laughs> paternity or stuff, just pick up a party political, um, a political party card and attempt to contest for uh, a position. And your history will be traced to you, both the truth and the lies. You know, people fabricated all sort of things against me that were not real. Uh, but the critical thing is to focus. Do you have a message to deliver? Yes. What was our message? Advocacy is lacking. I am coming from a district that is very deprived, um, that is not getting a share of the national cake. And what is needed there is a strong leader, one with the capacity to do proper representation, one with the capacity to advocate for development in the area. And I think my constituent bought this over tribal sentiments. I mean, you would find people telling you, we have several tribes in the constituency. We have the Cesales, we have the Gatis, we have Wala, we have Moshi, Flanese, all within the mix. And you, you will find people trying to push for a Cesala candidate um, others thinking that, okay, there are two people of uh, Dagati origin, let's play the vote, let the Sasala candidate win. But what was interesting is that people will tell you, we don't care the tribe of the person. What we care is development. What we care is someone who can represent us well. And so when these tribal sentiments come up, you find people within the same tribe rising up and saying, look, look at the quality, not the color the person is wearing. Look at the quality, not the language the person speaks. And I think that really, really, really worked. And if there's a lesson I've learned from this, it is that politicians must begin to realize, as His Excellency um, John Dramani Mahama stated, the delegates are the kingmakers, and they appreciate and know what is good, and they know what they want. The era where you just attack someone's character, their personality, and use that to get vote is long past. They are sifting um, between the messages they receive. They analyze it. You see people who are not educated to a very high level, but they understand the issues more than one would expect. And that is what I, 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 I encountered here. I went with messages in education, uh, in the health sector, in youth empowerment, in women empowerment. And then what you get from the other side is just a barrage of attacks. You know, no clear message on what they intend to do, what they want to do. And, and, and I also presented the best chance for the party regaining that seat. Because we had a situation where our presidential candidate had over 70% of the votes, yet we lost the seat. There were divisions in the party, and we needed a new face that would unite the party. And people saw me as that person who did not have 
any uh, previous political stains uh, who is unblemished to say in the political landscape, though I have helped in the district a lot, in the constituency a lot, I've supported the party over the years, I did not have any direct sides in these divisions. And therefore, I came off as one that can unite the party. So I think we really need to respect uh, um, the delegates. And I'm so grateful to the delegates in Lambusi. I'm so grateful to my campaign team. I'm so grateful to all the elders that bought into the message I came with. And the final one I will say is that like His Excellency John Dramani Mahama has stated in his acceptance speech today, if you talk about giving people opportunity, talk about fighting corruption, talk about um, 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 abolishing things like S. Gracia, these are things that people want to hear. We are seeing situations where there are vacancies for jobs are not advertised, yet people are um, giving up employment. And you have people sitting with certificates and degrees in the city center just playing games because there's nothing for them to do. So when you bring that kind of hope, the people buy into that message. Yeah, I mean, and, and when, when I return from the break, I need to ask the question because today John Mama clarifies something as far as the aggression is concerned. He says the ministers you appoint, you have to sign an undertaking to forego the the ex gratia even before that constitutional provision is reviewed and i'll ask all of you if you get um, appointed if you win uh, are you ready to sign that undertaking not to benefit from ex gratia and then um, i'll get the thoughts of um the muntaka mubarak the party definitely must begin a, a a campaign to unite the ranks on the back of what has happened particularly from himself now that we know that he was a target he survived what would it take to unite the party? I'll get the, the thoughts of um, Sadiq as well on that. Very important subject. John Mama today says one of the first things you want to do immediately is to meet all the incumbents who lost. There are 16 or so of them who lost. Muntaka says 16 too many, and that could have been avoided. I'll get his thoughts after this. And, and th thank you very much for staying with us. I, I'm, I'm learning a lot of lessons uh, just having a com this conversation indeed. Um, and so let's delve into the uh, other part of this. The NDC will have to close ranks. You have to mend the cracks. Uh, Sadiq, stay with me. I'm going to go to um, uh, the MP for Sawase, now former uh, Minority Chief of Muntaka Mubarak. Mr. Mubarak, so obviously something must be done immediately to repair the harm that has happened over the last few weeks in this campaign. What can the party do to fix this crack, the fracture that we've seen going into the primary? Well, I, mean, I have to admit that uh, His Excellency John Amad Mama has a lot of work to do. If uh, we have to be able to make real progress. And believe me, he, I know he may, we may all have to take some rest maybe a two or a month, when people have really refreshed themselves, I believe that he must have a session with starting from sitting members of parliament. He's meeting those who have lost. He may get an, an insight from each and every one of them. What might have happened, what they thought really caused their defeat. He must equally meet all those who have won, not in large groups. Maybe he can choose to do it in regions where it is smaller, so in the case of maybe Asante, because we are only three, he may add Ahapo and some Bono. So he, in a smaller group, to listen to people, because you see, there's some disease that we need to cure. And I'm sorry to say, I am of a very strong belief that if that disease is not cured, it could cause a lot of problems for us. Why am I saying this disease must be cured? You see, there are a lot of people that have dipped their fingers and nose into consequences. His Excellency must hear people's verdicts and people complain. So that if, for example, after talking to, say, these 137 MPs, and you get a clear indication that specific individuals have been repeatedly been mentioned, this campaign for 2024, let them take a back seat. Okay. Don't let them lead any campaign. But if they do, the antagonism will continue. And look, one thing about politics, 
And uh, I'm with all humility and with a lot of respect to my colleagues that unless I have contested several elections, this, this will be my seat. People don't forgive. Mm. Because when you do that, people don't easily forgive. They may keep quiet, but they are looking for an opportunity to strike. Because they believe that, look, even in this time of times of difficulty, this is what some people have done. What if we get power? They may be doing worse because that, that time they may even have been supported with uh, political authority. So to, to tell those members that this your fear is genuine and I'm going to allay it, this person will take a back seat and not be allowed to take a front seat. Can you imagine, for example, in a front seat, even the venue where we should hold the election had to be decided at first. It was a subject of financial executive committee meeting. I how? See. How? What? What kind of interference is that? I mean, it was some of the interference was so deep. In my case, there's like failing. A national officer was in my conference to campaign with the opponent. With my opponent, and this party, nobody, whether from the council of elders, from no nothing, everybody kept quiet. Now you thought that you were just. I mean, you're just going to finish me, I've survived. Mm. So for those who have lost and those who have won, but they have this concerns, his Excellency must listen to them. He has a very big advantage. One of the advantages that His Excellency Gentleman Obama has is that each and every one of us, even those who have just won their primaries and those who have lost and those of us who have been in there for long, we all have one thing that is very clear to us, that the 2024 election, is a must win for NDC. None of us, whether those who have lost, those who have managed to win, those who are coming in new, all of us know if we fail to win 2024 election, we will have set a bad precedent for ourselves that we will be the first political party in the Fourth Republic that could not come back to power after it. And I don't think any of us, regardless of the pain that you have, want that to happen. So that's the truth. His Excellency Gentleman Mama will have to use. And believe me, this campaign uh, and, 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 and everything about it towards the 2024, the Senate must take a, a, a center role. He must not uh, delegate, I mean, he must not allow people to do too many things without his, his detailed understanding of what they are doing and without his, him watching. Because believe me, I have seen that in my conference a number of times. You turn your back and assume that, oh, the executives are capable. Every one of them is pursuing his or her personal interest. And that is always the danger that you have the one who is the candidate. And I, I saw that in 2016, when I was busy thinking I was going around other constituencies in the region, and I left my constituency for the executives to run because I believed that, oh, you know, some of them were there for a uh, number of years. To my utmost shock, we got to the election, and then our, our, our vote had to know that. Even though, yes, yeah, there was a general trend in, across the country, in 2016, against NDC, and largely a lot of constituencies had their uh, vote nose diving. But I didn't believe that the, the, the about 4,000 nose dive in Aswazi was realistic. Then in 2020, I took the center stage and virtually controlled everything. You are going to communicate, let me know what you are going to do. The training of the agent, I participated in the training. We trained the agent like six times and did all those things. Before we realized, we jumped from uh, uh, 39, hitting over 50. So I want to encourage that his Excellency will have a lot of work to do. I know it's very tiring. I mean, it's very stressful. But luckily, he's very experienced. He has been contesting as member of parliament. He's been there, I mean, during the of Mills, as the then uh, running mate. Then he contested in 2012 as president. 2016, yes, we lost. He picked the lesson. 20. 20 years he lost, we picked those lessons. I want to believe that he has what it takes. But earlier, you made some analysis yeah. about uh, uh, Commander Dufour. Yes, the Dufour, yeah. Give me your thoughts on it. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me correct you. Let me correct you. You see, in Asante region, we have 47 consequences, but we have only four cities. Oh, 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 unfortunately, we lost you briefly. Yeah. If, we can, if we can repeat what you said. We lost your audio. Yeah, yeah. Do you hear me now? Can yes, I can. Yes, now? yes. I'm saying that in Asante region, we have 47 constituencies. 
out of the 47 constituencies, we have only four sitting MPs. Okay. And in this context, where you have sitting MPs, the bar is very high. The interest is very high. In Asante, because most of the constituencies, especially out of the 47, I can tell you in confidence that, yes, we have Tepa, we have Aguano, North, some few, I mean, Acrofrome, some few that we only think that with some effort we may be able to win them. So there, there will be fair contest in those ones. But in about almost 30 conferences, there's no any interest. Because there's the did believe that, look, it's essence to the Raman Rama. I mean, it's not having any contest. There's no any contest. Other than that, Kojo Bonsu will have equally made a mark because in terms of the region, believe me, Kojo Bonsu have a better footing than even before. For example, one community report wanted to meet uh, delegates in my constituency. They told me that they were interested. He wanted to hire a, a place. They said, no, we are not interested. So they have to now combine Oforukrum and Aswasi in Oforukrum. And I doubt whether a single person from Aswasi went to that meeting. There was no interest in Asante because 47 constituencies, only four sitting constituencies, were the fierce contest. So that's what explains why the, you didn't have, uh, you had about 23,000 uh, people who didn't come out uh, to go because the, virtually there's no month to, to, to do. So lastly, on this uh, unity, I want to plead with all of us, those who have won, those who have lost, those who are coming new, that all of us should know we still have a lot of work to do. We yeah. have a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, and, and, on that, on that point, and on that point, if, if I may, I want to bring in Sadiq very quickly. Sadiq, you listen to Muntaka Mubarak, an experienced hand, talk about yes. the, the challenges that he faced and what he believes to be the the roadmap now going forward, which is going to be very challenging to bring people together. You are a new face um, on the block in the NDC at this level. You listen to him talk, and what, what's your reaction? What is going through your head? Uh, well, um, he, said, he said much, and obviously uh, from what he said and what he's been saying about is the involvement of um, some national officers in this campaign, um, obviously, means there are a lot of undercurrents that um, must be must, must there must be a lot of work in terms of ensuring that somebody with the with the pedigree of Montaka is uh, w there's there's a lot of attempt in ensuring that he's he's fully brought on board. I, I have no doubt, regardless that he's fully committed to the end and is fully on board. But I think a lot of the issues he cites. Uh, but very important issues that need let, that. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. That, does it scare you to hear all this? And and note something. Himself, Sam George, Felix, all experienced this because they've been in there for a while. They've stepped on toes. You are yes. new. You are new. And and so you and Titus, both of you, I guess, didn't experience as much of that. Does it scare you but, going forward that you may begin to experience these forces? And, and, well, and what, how do you how do you see that your career in this space with everything you're hearing from the experienced hands? As much as it gives me um, um, a point of as much as it's a point of concern to me, like Titus spoke about earlier, I think that it also provides us an insight into how to manage ourselves going forward. I'm not saying that I mean um, none of the candidates or none of the um, or the successful um, um, candidates today didn't manage themselves. So I think they did. And I think their work and their pedigree and their CV speaks for it. Uh, but most importantly as well, I mean, sometimes you never can tell when anybody will take an interest against you. I mean, I didn't have um, quite of, uh, I didn't experience it on the level that they did beyond the usual propaganda that strong candidates will face, you know. Um, but I think that my and my t myself and the team's ability to turn some of the things that were thrown at us into strong points uh, to make to to the delegates was what probably, probably worked for us. Mm. One of the shock, shocking things that was spoken to me was, was was said about me in the constituency was the fact that I was not from the constituency. When in, when in actual fact, almost everybody publicly on national media, everybody knows that this is this is the this is this is the point or this is where Sadiq represents the most, you know. But I think that one of the things that has been running across it. And if you look at the success of all of us that are on, on, on this uh, platform this evening, it's the fact that the delegates are more discerning today and understand the issues. The delegates will focus on substance over, over form, over money, or anything like that. 
And I think that's all, that's what went. Because when I look, when I listen to everybody on the platform, it seemed as though regardless of the campaign, regardless of the machinations, everybody was focused on selling a message. Everybody was focused on bringing along the, the delegates on the journey. Mm. And I'm sure all of us, this is what perhaps may have worked, which, in, which also indicates that the delegates of the NDC today are, are, are wiser, descending, and are more than ready more than ready to find or, or to elect winnable and competent candidates to enable them to win. And, and, and you make that point, I noticed that even in places where people were seen throwing money and spreading it, those people lost. Some hope somebody <laughs> brought a bag of a, a truck full of rice, parked it right in front of the polling station. When you vote, you exit, you get the rice, you go. He lost. And that goes to prove that the delegate is now wiser to those machinations. But I want to return to something that Muntaka said about reuniting the ranks, reuniting the ranks going forward. You said a lot of interesting things that needs to happen. What's your take? What, what, what would you add to that? Well, well I think it's important. Uh, actually, just with more the forces that try to play my constituents, especially from the region, because those forces themselves are grasping for their own lives. Mm. And, and they, they had better be careful, because in Greater Accra, we will not countenance because as far as we are concerned in Greater Accra, Greater Accra is, going to, is key and critical for President Mahama mm. winning the next election. And Greater Accra will determine the next president of Ghana. And, and so those individuals or that individual who thinks that he can run it like his private enterprise, must, this is notice. And Ningbo Pram Pram was where we served notice to him. Is he a national executive? No, a regional executive. Okay. You know, he, he, and that's what I'm saying that, and like Felix said, at times the influences come from various levels where people think that they think themselves mightier, you know, when butterflies think of themselves as eagles, you know, and, and, and so in Ngo Pram Pram, I told him the instructions he was giving to the EC on phone, he should come as a man onto the ground and come and give the instruction and let's see, you know, but we would need to mend and deal with this crack. How? Discipline. Who must, I, who must bring that? It must come from the national executives, from our national chairman, Asidu Nketia. And Asidu Nketia is a man who pulls no punches and, and like, 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 he takes no prisoners. He, he's, he's got the guts to take tough decisions. As general secretary, we saw him take very tough decisions. As national chairman, I want to see him bring discipline. That should be, I want to remember Asidu Nketia as that national chairman who instilled discipline from the national all the way to the grassroots in our party. Fifi Kwete is a no-nonsense person. As general secretary, I want to see some fight from them. Look, and, and you see me when I say it, and they say Sam George, Sam George, Sam George. The elections in my constituency were held up for an hour. Yeah. It happened immediately after 80 men came and left. He came with tanks to come and disrupt the elections. But it was suspended, yeah. You get it. You have this man sitting in the national in the in the council of state serving under the MPP and sitting in your council of elders meeting. Then you turn around and tell people that people are leaking information. Why can't we call a spade a spade and say this person is no longer with our party? We are distancing ourselves from you. Until we call a spade a spade in our party and say, look. Yes, you are a senior, we thank you, thank you for your service, but if you can no longer toe the line of the party, no individual is bigger than the party. But a party that lacks the balls and the guts to discipline errant elders cannot rein in exuberant young people. And so you begin to have pockets of people beginning to take the law into their own hands. You want to fix this party? Instill discipline. And you instill discipline from the very top like the MPP or hates Nanado, when he thought he needed control of the power of the party, he kicked out an elected national chairman, general secretary, and first national uh, vice chairman. The party didn't collapse. They went on to win an election 18 months but later. They, they won it with a historic margin. Because then discipline was instilled in the rank and file of the MPP. That is what is lacking in the NDC. We need discipline. If the party leadership can't give it, I'm expecting President Mahama as our new flag bearer, now he's the leader of the party, to take that lead role, instill discipline. Bring everybody, like Muntaka said, invite everybody, listen to everybody, 
and be able to say, this is the way we will go. Anybody, anybody who seeks to take a contrary stand to the position of the leader must be shown the exit. Mm. You must be dealt with. You see, people say politics is about numbers. I say politics is about good numbers. Because there are some numbers where you put them in your team. They destroy you. Ask Kwabna before. <laughs> Why? Well, uh, haven't you seen his team? <laughs> <laughs> well, those <laughs> numbers. But those numbers led him <laughs> to the ditch where well, like, well, so far, I think that all the speakers have made valid points. You see, there are two strands to this thing. There's the fallout that arises out of the verbal jousting that goes into campaigns. That everybody can deal with because we all understand that in these periods, a bit of verbal jousting is allowed. So that is hardly a problem. The difficulty arises when people who have been put in certain positions and who are expected to manage the process act in ways that tend to skew the elections in favor of one candidate or the other. That is where the problem arises from. So, because anybody who loses an election and feels that the process was not fair, it was not balanced, and that things were done in a manner to undermine his or her chances, has a difficulty lending themselves to any reconciliatory process. So that really is a difficulty. Again, Sam George is spot on, and I'm on all fours with him, when he speaks about the need to instill discipline in our party. Look, national officers must exhibit responsibility. So when you are put in there as a national officer, you must act in ways that advance the interests of the party. It is not unusual in politics to have a situation where, based on one or two considerations, the party believes that this candidate is preferable to that candidate. In instances like that, what you use is dialogue and a consultative process to impress upon a person who will be adversely affected as to why it is necessary to make that sacrifice. But if you do not do that, and you attempt to sidestep the process or skew the process in a manner that makes it unfair, then you are going to have some of these difficulties. I had a challenge with a national organizer, and it resulted in some controversy. I'm sure you read it. Yeah. I do not want to go into that. Yeah. But what business did a national organizer have interfering in a constituency election like that? That's Joseph Yavin. Absolutely. And, it's, and AAK is not the only place where he's accused of that. In fact, in Mutaka's country. Absolutely. You see, the whip must be cracked. You are a national organizer. So organize the party nationally. When you lend such direct support to candidates and move into candidates' uh, territories to interfere in that manner, you create divisions within the party. So I also expect that the national leadership of the party will take a serious view of this, that going forward, they will put in place structures that make it impossible for people occupying such positions to interfere, poke their noses in that manner, in consequences that, that, that have some of these contests going on. I am reiterating the point that we should act proactively as a party. Indeed, I have seen instances where regional chairmen have made valid cases before national executive as to why this or that candidate is preferable. And proper steps have been taken to engage everybody involved so that a united front is then presented. Mm. Because consensus building, as Dr. Obeda Samoa once said, consensus building is the best form of democracy. So if you believe that Evans is a preferable candidate and has some comparative or competitive advantages that would inure to the benefit of the party, Make it clear, make it open, make it transparent, involve whoever is also an interested party in the matter. But do not make it seem that merely because you have power at the national level, you are going to sidestep the process, treat somebody unfairly, and expect that they will come on board. I expect the reconciliatory effort to be deeper. Okay. It should not be superficial or shallow. People have been offended. There are those who can let things go, like myself. There are also those who hold on to grudges forever. Mutaka said that. Absolutely, there are those... Most of them to forgive. Well, I do not believe that people don't forgive in politics. <laughs> I certainly do not hold those grudges. There are those who also uh, have a long memory and therefore do not readily forgive. They may not speak, but they will act in ways that undermine the parties of our all chances in consequences and even at the national level. But everything boils down to running the NDC properly, like a professional organization, where office holders and duty bearers perform their tasks devoid of emotion or interference, where there is transparency, where there is candor, where there is consultation, where there is involvement. If these things are in place, we will not have some of the difficulties that we are having at this particular moment. So I believe that all is not lost yet. We still have sufficient time. And knowing President Mahama for who he is, he is an honest broker. He will stamp his authority on, on the process. I think that the current national executive ought to be given time to find their foot. I think they came into office at a time when the contest was upon us. So perhaps they didn't have sufficient time to master the process. But in the circumstances, they've done a sterling job because overall, it's been a huge success. Absolutely. There have been pockets of difficulties. There are some places where elections had to be put on hold for very good reason. And I'm sure that the processes will be 
undertaken to ensure that those outstanding consequences are also delivered. Mm. But going forward, I expect uh, some kind of overhaul in the way that we manage our electoral process. For instance, there were too many controversies about the register. I had to engage in a battle with the regional executive of the central well, you had one over, the over a month. For over a month, we were trying to resolve difficulties with the register, which should be fairly easy to deal with. There, was, there were efforts you know, to tamper and interfere with the register. And it took us one month to resolve. Precious time was wasted on something that should have been pretty straightforward. Somehow we managed to resolve it. Even on election day, it's popped up, but we managed to use dialogue to resolve it peacefully. So I am saying that these things ought to be avoided going forward. We've been in, in, in place for about 30 years. These things should not be happening. We should, we should operate in a manner that allows the people of Ghana to take us seriously. If we intend to govern, our capacity to do so must reflect in what we do, even in opposition. That is the only way that we can win the confidence of the people of Ghana to give us a mandate to govern. But if we do not do things properly, and the simple matter of managing an election like this, forget about the logistical nightmare that elections present, yeah. but this is something that we've done over the years. So we should not have difficulty. Going forward, we should be mastering the process and perfecting them, not having these difficulties that are self-inflicted. There is also too much personal interest in the way that our party is governed, rather than acting mechanically like a machine. People take interest in specific constituencies and act in ways to favor their candidates. Yeah. That is, I know that politics is not straightforward. No, there are things, as uh, one prominent MPP uh, founding father said, politics is a deep river. And so things happen. But everything that happens must be done for a purpose. And the purpose should be the overall interest of the party yeah. going forward. Felix, thank you very much. Uh, Sam, thank you very much. Munteka Mubarak, I'm grateful. Titus Abeyo, thank you very much. And Sadiq, thank you as well. All of you for joining us on PMS Press. Um, we'll see where the reconciliation effort starts and where it ends. Hopefully, we can get Seudin Ketia or Fifi Kwete to sit for a conversation so we can have clarity on the path forward, reconciling the NDC and facing the MPP in the contest next year. We'll get that done and get that clarity for you. Enjoy the rest of the evening.